Okay. So good evening, everyone. Uh, we are back again with one of the most powerful sessions and power packed discussion again. So welcome to Global Interdisciplinary Summit 2020. I am Dr. Gagandeep Kaur, the main team member of GOMA. Global Interdisciplinary Summit is basically uh, correlated and combined with the Global Outreach Medical and Health Association. So moving on to the introduction, that Global uh, Outreach Medical and Health Association is a global organization representing the medical and health profession. It promotes and provides accreditation, certification, education, training, and other resources for organizations, professionals, and students. The Global Outreach Medical and Health Association has formally established a leadership role in medical and health sectors. So before moving on to the session, I would like to give a key, uh, few key points to the participants. Basically, that the participation certificate will solely be presented to all those who are the GOMA members. If anyone, anybody is not carrying GOMA membership, kindly register to it, going on to www.gomha.org. And there will be a link that will be shared in between of this session, which has to be filled. It includes a form, basically. A screenshot has to be shared of the session, which will be acting as a proof of the participant for the attendance. And the certificate will be submitted submi and submitted and will be directly posted to the emails, which will be provided in form. So with this, we'll move on to the introduction about our today's speaker, Dr. Dan. Dr. Dan is a lifelong Texan, having grown up in Humble and Midland, Texas. So if I'll talk about him, he's basically graduated with honors from the University of Texas Health Science Center at, at San Antonio and commissioned as an officer in the United States Navy. Dr. Dan is a periodontist who specialized in advanced procedures such as immediate full mouth dental implant treatment, traditional dental implant treatments, bone regeneration, sinus lifts, and the treatment of periodontal disease. Doctor is a board certified by both the American Board of Periodontology and the International Congress of Implantologists. Currently, Doctor serves as the Chief Clinical Officer of DIA Dental Implant Center. He's published over 50 peer-reviewed journal articles and textbook chapters. He's a highly sought educator by many dental implant companies and has provided over 100 lectures worldwide. He has been named a leader in continuing dental education by Dentistry Today magazine for 13 consecutive years. So with this introduction, I will move on to the speaker of today, Dr. Dan, and the stage is all yours, sir. Okay. Okay, can you hear me? Yes, sir. All right, very good. Uh, let me make sure that my screen is sharing. All right, how's that? Can you see the screen? Uh, yes, sir. All right, very good. Okay, well, welcome everybody. Uh, good evening, good morning, good afternoon. I know we've got people here from all over the world. Uh, I know our host was uh, telling me it's uh, nine o'clock in India where she's at and it's dinner time and it's, uh, it's 10 o'clock in the morning here, so. Uh, I know we have people here from all over. Uh, today we'll be talking about pterygoid implants and we're gonna be talking about using these for full arch immediate loading. Now, I know from talking to a lot of colleagues, uh, pterygoid implants are something that um, are not uh, very well understood by many people. Uh, as a matter of fact, some people uh, have never even heard of pterygoid implants. You know, there's some uh, recent studies that show that uh, of dental students, only 17% of dental students even knew what a pterygoid implant was or had even heard of a pterygoid implant. Uh, if you also look at the literature, uh, you can see that uh, among dental implants, pterygoid implants have the least amount of publications. Um, also, if you think about uh, conferences or seminars that you've been to, you know, how many lectures have you seen on pterygoid implants compared to traditional implants, uh, all on four style, um, zygomatic implants? You, know, you don't see a whole lot of lectures on pterygoid implants. And uh, I'll be publishing a textbook that's solely devoted to 
pterygoid implants. And that textbook will be coming out. If I can get my screen to advance. Uh, that textbook will be coming out uh, later this summer and it will be on Amazon. But uh, before then, you can pre-order the textbook if you want at pterygoidimplantbook.com and it'll give you a little bit more information on the book. So a lot of what you see in the uh, webinar today will be also featured in this book. It's about 150 plus pages and the entire book is completely devoted to pterygoid dental implants. So we're gonna begin today with a little bit of a history lesson. So we're gonna get in our time machine here and we're gonna go back in time. So where are we going? We're going to the 1970s. So why are we in the 1970s? Well, in the 1970s is when pterygoid implants first came onto the scene. And there were a number of articles published by Linkow uh, and Hahn and a number of others, and they were utilizing uh, pterygoid extension implants. Now, these were the subperiosteal frame style implants. And what they found was that when they had distal extensions, that if they were able to utilize the dense bone of the pterygoid maxillary complex, that they had uh, much better support for these distal extensions. And so throughout the 70s, there were quite a few papers that were published on uh, utilization of the pterygomaxillary complex uh, for implants at that time. Now, as we get in our time machine and move a little bit forward, we're gonna now land in the 80s and uh, 90s and 2000s. So as we moved into the 80s, their subperiosteal frame style implant, you know, uh, fell a little bit out of favor, uh, more in favor of the root form implant, which we currently utilize today. And it wasn't until 1989 that Tulaski described the use of modern root form implants for utilization in the pterygoid, uh, pterygo maxillary complex. And so in the 90s uh, and the 2000s, we started to see a number of articles published uh, by Balshi, uh, Graves, uh, Rodriguez, Peñarocha, and uh, most of these articles that utilize pterygoid implants were uh, of a delayed load protocol. Uh, and it wasn't until the late 2010s, 2018, 2019, 2020, that we began seeing articles published on utilization of pterygoid implants for immediate loading. So I published an article in 2018. Um, uh, Henri uh, Diedrich has published a number of articles with his colleagues um, out of Luxembourg. Uh, uh, Nag has published a number of uh, articles using his uh, all tilt technique out of India. Uh, Diedrich has cortically fixed uh, at once technique. So there are uh, a number of papers now being published where we're utilizing pterygoid implants for immediate loading. And this shows a sample case of how we're doing this. And we're gonna show the benefits and the rationale for why we're placing the pterygoid implants. So typically we're using these for full arch immediate load, at least in my practice, uh, my practice is predominantly full arch immediate load. And uh, after doing this for a long time, there are a lot of situations that popped up where pterygoid implants really helped and provided a lot of benefit. And you know, we know that full arch immediate loading works. We have 20 plus years of data on this. We know that, uh, you know, uh, there's been a number of studies published on this technique from multiple different authors from all over the world. And we know that the implant success rate is very, very high, 98 plus percent. And we know that the prosthetic survival rate on this is also very high, typically over 99%. So if we have such high success rate with dental implants and we have a such high success rate with prosthetics, why do we even need pterygoid implants? Why do we have to change something that's already working well? Well, let's take a look at why we might wanna use a pterygoid. We wanna use it for additional support. And by that, we can increase the composite torque value. And I'll go over what that means a little bit later in the lecture. We can improve the AP spread, the anterior posterior spread for our prosthetics. And we can eliminate cantilever, which is one of the significant benefits of utilizing pterygoid implants. It's also 
an alternative to zygomatic implants in some situations. Uh, zygomatic implants are great. It's a wonderful uh, adjunct. Uh, we use them quite frequently in our office, but occasionally you do get some patients that uh, just will not consent to a zygomatic implant. Sometimes it just sounds too scary for them, and uh, a pterygoid implant can be an alternative in some situations. We can also utilize it as a rescue implant. And uh, I've used these implants to bail myself out of a number of situations, also to help some other practitioners when they're having complications with the cases. We can many times stick in a pterygoid implant and it will provide a significant amount of benefit. And we'll show some cases as to how we use the pterygoid for a rescue. So let's look at improving anterior posterior spread and cantilever elimination. So we have a typical case here. And if we look at the sinuses, we can see that we have fairly low sinus floors. We can also see that the walls, the anterior walls of the sinus are located uh, uh, pretty far anteriorly where they are at the area of the canine. So if we're looking at our traditional uh, all on four style implant approach, we would be putting the implants about here trying to angle them to avoid the maxillary sinuses. So if we did this setup, this is about typically what we would have for our restoration. Now we know from uh, a number of studies, you know, dating back to uh, English that uh, typically the AP spread is accepted at 1.5 uh, times um, uh, anterior posterior implant positions. So if we're utilizing that scenario, scenario, this is about what we would have in terms of our restoration. And this is pretty typical because if you look at most literature that's published on all on four style dental implant treatment, typically the restoration is having about 12 teeth. Uh, some publications it's even shorter with 10 teeth, um, but the typical is about 12. Now you do have some patients that want 14 teeth. And many times uh, I'll have patients specifically ask, you know, well, how many teeth am I going to get in my final restoration? And we tell them, well, the typical amount is 12. And they say, well, you know, I have 14 teeth, you know, on the top now to start with, you know, I'd like to be able to keep that amount of teeth if I can. And, you know, in those situations, we have to tell the patient, well, in the past, we would say we have to do a sinus lift and we'd have to, you know, put some additional implants into anchor into bone if we want to give you that many teeth because we can't have these really long cantilevers. Because if we extend them out to here, we can see that we're violating the you know, 1.5 times AP spread rule. And we're going to end up with, you know, a number of complications due to excessive cantilever length. In some publications, the uh, cantilever length rule is even shorter. In some publications, uh, it's 0.5 AP spread. Uh, so if we could do something to eliminate this cantilever, it's gonna provide significant benefit. So we could see by placing two pterygoid implants here, we completely eliminate the cantilever. We're able to give uh, the patient 14 teeth. Um, now also another situation where you may wanna do this is if somebody has a very high smile line, or a very wide smile line. Because if somebody has an extremely wide smile and you are only able to go back to the first molars, in some patients, when they smile, you will be able to see uh, you know, those black spaces in the buccal corridor space uh, at the end of the restoration because you don't have second molars. And obviously from an aesthetic point of view, that's not gonna be acceptable to many patients. So by able to extend the restoration further back through the utilization of pterygoid implants, we can eliminate that in those patients with very high smiles or very, very wide smiles. So why do we wanna eliminate cantilevers? So one, we know that there's a number of studies that show that uh, excessive cantilever length can cause increased stress on the terminal peri-implant bone. And I can tell you that uh, over the years, uh, this is something that I have seen because uh, I do uh, the surgeries and the restorations on most of my cases, at least in the past I did. And so when you're doing the surgery and the restoration, you get to see all the complications. And so, uh, you know, many times a surgeon will do the 
procedure and then the case disappears to the restoring dentist and the surgeon never sees the case again. And they don't see some of the problems and headaches that the restoring dentists deal with. Uh, when you're doing everything yourself, you get to see all of those problems. And you know, some of the problems that I've seen over the years, you know, almost always come back to cantilevers in many, many situations. And so I've modified my technique to try to eliminate or reduce cantilevers as much as possible. And I can tell you that I've had a lot fewer problems uh, ever since uh, I've been doing that. So we know that cantilevers can cause increased screw loosening. Uh, they can cause increased screw fracture and they can cause increased prosthetic problems. And you know this is borne out in a number of studies, uh, you know, many more than I could fit here at the bottom of the seminar. So another reason for using pterygoid implants would be to increase the composite torque value. So what is composite torque value? Well, uh, essentially what that is, CTV is the insertion torque for dental implants. If you take all of the implants, you add up the insertion torque, that gives you your composite torque value. And typically we want this to be about 120 centimeters. And uh, if we look at a case such as this, in this case we had, and uh, I think this patient was 82, 83 years old, and he had a handful of implants left, but they had a significant amount of bone loss uh, from the facial aspect. You can also see that the uh, patient has uh, pneumatized sinuses, and I can tell you that the bone in this anterior region was uh, fairly thin. And so I talked to this patient about doing zygomatic implants and because of his age, he declined that option. Uh, it was just something that he did not wanna do. And so with this bone in the very front with these very short roots and the amount of bone loss that we have around the implants from the uh, facial aspect, uh, there just wasn't a whole lot of bone there. And so what I did was sinus grafts on both sides since he didn't want zygomatics. And when we put these implants into this regenerated bone, the insertion torque was a bit on the low side, uh, not quite as high as we'd like it to be. And so in doing an immediate load in that situation could possibly cause some risk. And so what I did was add two pterygoid implants here. And by adding the two pterygoid implants, um, I was able to increase the composite torque value significantly. And um, the composite torque value, if we look at studies by Jensen, typically he's recommending 120 Newton centimeters. So if you take up the insertion torque for all of the uh, implants, add them together. If you get 120 Newton centimeters, then we know typically we're going to have a good chance of success. So in 2018, I published a study and we looked at 25 pterygoid implants. All these were immediately loaded because we were able to utilize the dense bone and the pterygomaxillary complex. And the average insertion torque for these implants was about 45 Newton centimeters. So if we look at two of these, we're already at 89 Newton centimeters. And this is giving us close to 75% of our composite torque value just by utilizing the pterygoids. So when we add in the additional implants, we're going to be significantly over the CTV for a full arch immediate load. So let's look at utilizing uh, pterygoid implants as a rescue style implant. So if we look at a case like this, we can see that the sinuses uh, are fairly anterior. We can see that the anterior wall is located uh, at the canine or a little bit beyond the canine. And so if we're looking to anchor implants into this area, uh, we know that they're gonna to have to be located fairly towards the anterior of the arch, which is not going to give us uh, quite enough teeth for a good AP spread. So in this situation, 
what I did on this particular case was a trans sinus implant and uh, anchored that into the piriform rim. And unfortunately, this implant ended up failing uh, during the healing process. So if we take this implant out of the equation, we can see that we only have these three implants left. And so my options at this point are to uh, take this implant out. If I take that implant out, I'm going to have to shorten this transitional restoration because I can't extend it all the way back to here, which is where we have it now, because that cantilever is gonna be really, really long. So also I would have to do a sinus lift here because if I need something to support here, because I don't have an implant here, uh, I'm gonna have to let that bone heal. And during all that healing process, we're gonna have the patient this really short restoration. And so what I did instead was place a pterygoid implant. We went ahead and removed this failed implant here. And that allowed us to keep this patient in a transitional restoration to where we didn't have to shorten it, we didn't have to change the aesthetics, we didn't have to do an additional uh, sinus graft, and it really uh, provided rescue for us. Uh, it's just, I call it a rescue implant. So if we compare these two scenarios, uh, utilizing this pterygoid implant as a rescue implant, we only had one additional surgery. It added three months of additional time to allow that to heal. And typically we don't even really go three months because the insertion torque is so high, typically after about eight weeks, we'll go ahead and go back in and start restoring that implant. Uh, the patient was able to keep his transitional teeth. We didn't have to shorten them and we eliminated the cantilever. So a lot of benefits. If we did not do a pterygoid implant as a rescue in this situation, we would have had two additional surgeries. We would have had to do the sinus lift, we would have then had to come back and place the implant. And that's gonna give him at least eight months of additional time, uh, possibly even longer. We would have had to shorten the transitional teeth during all that healing phase, which patient would not have been very happy about just from an aesthetics point of view and a function point of view. And we would still have a cantilever at the end of all of this. So we see a lot of benefits to utilizing that pterygoid implant as a rescue. So let's look at some anatomy that is pertinent for placement of a pterygoid implant. So what is the pterygoid maxillary bone complex? Well, basically we have the maxillary tuberosity, the pyramidal process of the palatine bone, and the pterygoid process of the sphenoid bone. So the tuberosity, uh, we're all pretty familiar with this. This bone typically very, very soft, a type four bone, low density, has a lot of marrow spaces, a lot of fatty tissue in this area. Uh, many times, you know, you don't even have to drill in this area. You can sometimes just push a drill, not even turn it on, and your drill will just advance through this bone because it's so soft. I've even seen many situations where the bone is so soft back there that the assistant using her surgical suction can literally suction the bone away without <laughs> even doing anything to the bone. We also have the sinus proximity here. And when we have a pneumatized sinus, we know that the amount of bone in that uh, tuberosity typically will decrease. So then we look at the sphenoid bone. The sphenoid bone, we're utilizing the pterygoid processes of the sphenoid bone. So this is about sphenoid and the palatine bone. It's a very dense type one bone. And this is uh, some of the bone that we're gonna utilize in anchoring our dental implant. Palatine bone is another bone that we're utilizing. And specifically in the palatine bone, we're utilizing the pyramidal process. So the pyramidal process of the palatine bone is a very dense type one bone, very, very solid. And studies have shown that this bone is you know, close to 140% more dense than the bone that we find in the maxillary tuberosity. So when you're advancing through the maxillary tuberosity, typically the first bone that you're going to hit when placing a pterygoid implant is the uh, pyramidal process of the palatine bone. And then from there, you'll uh, get into the um, uh, pterygoid process of the sphenoid bone, the pterygoid maxillary pillar. And you're going from a very, very soft bone to a very, very hard bone, just very, very abruptly. And 
you know that you've engaged this bone when you feel that really, really hard stop. So the typical thickness of this pyramidal process is going to be about six and a half millimeters thick in the anterior posterior direction, and about nine and a half millimeters thick in the medial lateral direction. Typical height for this is about 13 millimeters. And there's a number of anatomic studies. Uh, most of them are actually medical studies and uh, that they've analyzed the uh, height of the uh, pyramidal process. And this is about the average of what we find in those studies. So if you look at some uh, CBCT scans, and this is uh, from a patient I recently did, uh, it shows very well the difference in density between the maxillary tuberosity. So we look at the gray values scale here, and we can see this is about 1141. And then we can see the pterygo maxillary pillar here. You can see the difference in density very easily on this uh, scan. And we can see that uh, the gray value scale is significantly higher in this area compared to the tuberosity. So we know if we can engage this bone with our implant, we're gonna have a lot more insertion torque. So let's look at some vital structures that are around the pterygomaxillary complex when we're placing pterygoid implants. So first we have the uh, pterygoid plexus. So this is a valve-free venous plexus. So uh, almost like a web of veins that is located in the infratemporal fossa. It's continuous with the cavern sinuses. Uh, they drain into the maxillary vein and they have significant hemorrhage potential. So if your implant is extending too far laterally and you hit the pterygoid plexus, uh, this can cause quite a bit of bleeding. And there are some reports in medical literature where they've looked at uh, surgical procedures, uh, many of them uh, tumor removal type procedures where the pterygoid venous plexus was damaged or not damaged. And the amount of blood loss uh, between them was significant. Uh, in some of the cases, they had up to eight liters of blood loss, which uh, you know, is obviously gonna require transfusion and you know, be a life-threatening situation for those patients. Uh, so this is uh, definitely something that you do not want to hit, you want to stay away from. Now this is lateral to where we're gonna be placing a pterygoid implant. So, in order to hit this, you would really have to be way off target, but it is in the proximity of where we're working. So it's definitely something that we want to keep uh, our eye out for. Also the maxillary artery. So the maxillary artery does uh, course uh, through the pterygoid venous plexus. Uh, it does have significant amount of hemorrhage potential if you're going too far laterally. Uh, but we also have the maxillary artery in another area that we're going to be working. So if we look at the pterygomaxillary fissure, this is connecting the infratemporal fossa to the pterygopalatine fossa. It's a conduit for our maxillary artery and also for our posterior superior alveolar nerve. And so there's a number of measurements. Uh, a lot of these are in uh, oral maxillofacial studies uh, for Lafort surgeries. And the average distance measurement from the maxillary tuberosity to the uh, uh, top of the pterygomaxillary fissure uh, is on average about 18 uh, millimeters. Uh, now that doesn't necessarily mean that's where the maxillary artery is. You know, in uh, a number of other studies, they've measured from the base of the uh, tuberosity to uh, where the maxillary artery is. And typically that's about 25 millimeters. And sometimes that varies depending on uh, the study that you're reading. So if we look at the pterygopalatine fossa, we know it's a cone-shaped fossa. It has eight foramina in here. And so we could see where these foramina are and it's connecting to uh, other various parts of the skull. It's conduit for a lot of vessels. Uh, and of particular concern for us in pterygoid implants is the third branch of the maxillary artery. And this gives off four additional branches. And so we wanna be careful for these when we're placing a pterygoid implant. So if we look at the maxillary artery and we wanna focus on this third part of the maxillary artery, the branches that we're most concerned with in placing a pterygoid implant is gonna be this main branch of the uh, third branch of the maxillary artery and the descending palatine artery. 
So if we look at the descending palatine artery that is traversing the greater palatine canal and exiting at the greater palatine foramen, it connects the pterygopalatine fossa to the oral cavity. It's containing the descending palatine artery. And these are located, if you look in the literature, uh, the greater palatine foramen about 16% of the time uh, opposite the second molar, uh, about 7% of the time between the second and third molar. The majority of cases, it's located at the third molar and in very few cases located distal to the third molar. And when we're placing a pterygoid implant, typically our target area is here. So in order to hit this, again, you'd have to be fairly off target. Uh, so there is potential to hit that, but again, like hitting the pterygoid plexus, you'd have to be quite a bit off target to hit that. But you can have anatomic variations, so that's something to keep in mind. So let's look at the implant insertion technique. So if we're looking at measurements from an anterior posterior direction, uh, on average, we are somewhere in the 70 degree range uh, in a lot of studies. Now, if you look at other studies, a lot of other studies report around a 45 degree angulation. And so why do we have some studies that are 45 degree angulation for a pterygoid implant? And why do we have some that are closer to 70 degrees? Well, it all depends on your insertion point. So if you're inserting more anteriorly, say closer to a second molar, then you're going to uh, angle this more and have closer to a 45 degree angulation. If you're inserting more posteriorly, then you're going to have a steeper angulation closer to a 70 degree angulation. And what's going to determine this in many cases is how much pneumonization that you have in your maxillary sinus. So if it's not quite as pneumatized, then you can come in a little bit more anterior and then your angle is going to be a bit uh, flatter if you have to go further back because the sinus is pneumatized, it's going to be a bit steeper. So if we're looking at now mediolateral insertion angle, uh, typically most articles are reporting this in the you know, 75 to 80 degree uh, insertion angle but sometimes it's gonna be different. It's all going to be anatomically based. Uh, so you wanna do some uh, cone beam analysis before you do these procedures to have an idea of how much angulation that you're gonna have. So you can see in this particular case, I angled this about 66 uh, degrees. Now some studies will measure this from the opposite way. So instead of having uh, say a 75 degree angulation, they'll report it as a 15 degree angulation, just depends on how you're measuring it. So if we look at our insertion angle, we can see typically if we have a 75 or 80 degree here, or it'll be five to 15 degrees if we're measuring from up here. So average size. In the literature, typically we see uh, 3.5 to 4.3 millimeter implants used. And if you remember from the anatomy that we presented earlier, the typical thickness in this area is about six to 6.7 millimeters in thickness. And typical lengths reported in the lit range from eight and a half to 20, even 25 millimeters. Now, many studies uh, will say that in order to truly be considered a pterygoid implant, that it needs to be uh, at least 13 to 15 millimeters to make sure you're engaging the pterygoid maxillary pillar, the pyramidal process of the palatine bone. And that if you're using something shorter, you know, eight and a half, 10 millimeters, 11 and a half millimeters, that you're more likely still actually in the tuberosity versus being in the uh, denser bone of the pyramidal process of the pillar. I could tell you that in most cases that I do, I'd say the average size I use in terms of length is 18 millimeters. Uh, occasionally we'll get longer, uh, occasionally a little bit shorter, but on average 18 millimeters. So insertion technique. So how are we doing this? Well, typically we'll start with a very sharp spade drill or an osteotome. And uh, some companies such as Norris Medical make a uh, osteotome that we can utilize to advance through the uh, very soft bone of the tuberosity. And then we're going to engage the denser, harder bone of the pyramidal process of the pterygomaxillary pillar. 
So again, we're going to have you know, between a 45 to 70 degree distal insertion angle, depending on uh, your sinus. And then we're going to have around a 75 to 80 degree palatal insertion angle. But again, that's all going to be anatomically dictated. And so typically what I'll do is I'll take this very sharp spade drill or a uh, osteotome. And many times you can just push it through the tuberosity because that bone is so soft. And you want to make sure that you hit this very dense bone. You'll feel just a very hard, abrupt stop. And if you're not feeling that stop, then you know that you have not engaged that bone. So you want to feel that stop. And so typically we're going to have about a 70 degree distal insertion angle. And we're going to have uh, 75 to 80 degree palatal insertion angle, medial lateral insertion angle. So one common comment about pterygoid dental implants is that uh, is considered a very difficult technique because it is essentially a blind insertion technique where as with most dental implants, say a traditional dental implant, you can pretty much see where you're drilling. You can take radiographs and see, check your depth. Uh, check your angle. Uh, with a zygomatic implant, you know, you can reflect and you can see the, uh, you can see where your drill exits the zygoma to know whether you're uh, drilling in the right direction. Uh, one of the difficulties with a pterygoid implant is that you can't see where you're going. You can't take an x-ray to see if you're at the right depth. You can't take an x-ray to check your angulation. So essentially this is a blind insertion technique. And that is what makes this procedure uh, somewhat disconcerting for a lot of clinicians. And so if you look at a lot of articles, uh, they'll all stress the necessity, uh, the necessity for feel when you're doing this procedure. It is very much a feel procedure. And when you're placing your first drill or your osteotome, you wanna feel a very hard stop Again, it's, you're going through that very soft tuberosity bone, and then you should feel like almost like you hit a brick wall when you hit that uh, pterygomaxillary pillar or the pyramidal process. It's a very, very dense type one bone. If you don't feel that stop, then typically you're going to be uh, lateral to the pterygomaxillary complex, and you're gonna wanna re-angle and try to feel that very hard stop again. And, uh, I'm getting a lot of messages on my phone about some people being kicked out of the meeting. So hopefully the, the Zoom is allowing people to come back in. Um, if anyone is being kicked out, I apologize for that. And so we know that if we could engage this pterygomaxillary junction, that we can get up to eight millimeters of dense bone engagement with our implant. And the insertion torque on this is typically very high. If you look at most articles that do report insertion torque, and there's not a whole lot of articles that give specifics on insertion torque, but typically the ones that do are showing, uh, you know, anywhere from 35 plus Newton centimeters. So very good insertion torque on these. And you can see here, if I zoom this in, that we've got over 60 Newton centimeters of insertion torque in this pterygoid, and that's very, very common. So let's look at some implant data for survival rates. If we look at some of the older studies, we can see the survival rate was a bit lower. And some of those older study utilized machine surface dental implants. Also, they were not, uh, some of those older implants were not end cutting. Whereas if we look at some of the newer studies, uh, we typically see survival rates that are very much in line with uh, what's reported for standard dental implants in the literature. Uh, 95%, 96%, uh, and in utilizing these for immediate load, we were getting close to 97% survival rate, which again is very much in line with uh, literature for other style implants. So failures. So there's a few articles uh, in the lit that have reported analysis of failures. And most of these articles and meta-analyses show that the failures occurred before implant loading because typically in the past, the majority of pterygoid implant articles were delayed load protocols. So uh, most of the failures were before loading. Uh, 
there's very few documented immediate load cases in the lit. There's a handful now. They're starting to become uh, more common now. Uh, but most of the failures reported in the lit typically were because the implant did not ever actually engage the pyramidal process of the palatine bone or the pterygomaxillary pillar. Typically, the, process, the placement of these implants was too lateral. So it was off to the side. The implant didn't really actually engage that dense type 1 bone. The medial lateral angle was too shallow. And we can see in an example here, the implant is not actually engaging that pterygomaxillary complex. You might still get some uh, you know, 20 Newton centimeters maybe of insertion torque because you're still getting that soft bone of the tuberosity, but you're not taking advantage of this very dense bone of the pterygomaxillary complex, which could significantly increase the insertion torque here. So if we took this implant and we were able to re-angle it and use a little bit longer implant, we'd be able to engage that dense type one bone and then insertion torque here would be dramatically higher. So bone loss for these implants over time, uh, very, very similar to what we see with traditional implants in other areas of the mouth. Complications. Complications reported in the literature range from hemorrhaging to trismus and also displacement uh, into various fossa or the sinus. And uh, there's a couple of articles in the lit that have documented displacement of pterygoid implants. Uh, and interestingly, some of these were guided cases. So just because you're using a guided case uh, does not necessarily mean that you can drop your guard and assume that you're going to automatically be in the uh, pterygomaxillary complex. So some contraindications, limited mouth opening because we're in the posterior part of the mouth. Uh, the access can be a bit difficult, uh, limited in these areas. So limited mouth opening is going to be a contraindication because even if you can get the implant in here, by the time you put the restoration in, it's going to be very difficult to get your uh, driver back there to put the screw in if the patient can't open very wide. Also, impacted third molars can make these uh, implants much more difficult because it takes away some of the available bone in this area. And before placing pterygoid implants, I never really uh, gave much thought to an impacted maxillary molar, and we just would pop them out and continue with our procedure. Now, if I see them, uh, I get a little worried because I know that if I do need to put a pterygoid implant back in the area, the bones available is going to be a bit less, and it's going to make the placement back there uh, a bit more difficult. So I'm going to share one last case where we show a variety of different implants, and we also employed a pterygoid implant in this case. And so this particular patient, uh, we can see that he has come from a different office. He's got a number of implants. He's got an impacted third molar. He's got another piece of impacted third molar that was left up in the maxillary sinus. And this patient had been ongoing treatment for over 18 months. He had a number of implant failures. He was a constant pain. At this point, he was falling into a depression because he just constantly having problems with these implants. He couldn't wear his prosthesis, which at this point was just a regular denture because uh, they never could load the implants. He had difficulty eating, uh, just was not in a very good place. So what I did is took those implants out. And I can tell you, when we took the implants out, the bone was very, very soft, very soft bone. And so I did was a pterygoid or a zygomatic implant here and here was not able to get a pterygoid implant here because if you remember, we had that fractured piece of uh, impacted third molar. So the amount of bone back here to engage was not very much. Uh, so we were not able to get one here, but we were able to get a pterygoid implant over on this side. Um, we utilized piriform rim implant, vomer implant, pterygoid implant, and longer implants in the mandible where we can engage the inferior border, the cortical bone down towards the bottom of the mandible. So we went from this, changing to this, significantly increased our composite torque value, and we were able to uh, end this man's 18-month uh, suffering that he was undergoing with the other implants. And here he is before and after. And so that gets us close to our time uh, on this. So we'll have a little bit of time to take questions. 
again, a lot of this, uh, this is just a little bit of information uh, on pterygoid implants. Uh, a lot more detail will be in the textbook that's coming out later this summer. And again, the website for that is pterygoidimplantbook.com. Uh, also, it'll be available on Amazon, but pre-ordering the book, you can save a little bit of money by going to the website, and this should be available uh, sometime later this summer. And so uh, at this point, uh, time-wise, uh, we want to go ahead and open the floor for questions, and um, I'll see what I can do to answer those for you. Um, thank you so much, sir, for the beautiful session you took and the beautiful oration you had. So with this, we'll move on to the questionnaire. Uh, so first question we have from Dr. Suraj. Prior to pterygoid implant placement, CBCT is must or we can judge with OPG? Uh, personally, I would say a CBT, uh, CBCT scan, um, just because it allows you to measure the angles. Most CBT, uh, CBCT scans have angle measurement tool. Uh, it's going to allow you to visualize things a lot better. Uh, I mean, certainly you could do one, of course, with just a, uh, a, a Panorex, uh, a standard traditional radiograph. Um, I think it would be more beneficial to have a cone beam scan, uh, but it, you know, a lot of this again is by feel. So if you are, you know, have a thorough knowledge of your anatomy, because you want to make sure that you're not too far off angle and that you're utilizing the right length of implant. On average, if you utilize a, you know, 13 to 18 millimeter implant in terms of length, you'll be safe uh, in term in most cases. Obviously, you know, you have some aberrant anatomy, but you know, for the standard person, you'll be safe with those link, uh, lengths. And as long as your angulations are uh, within those angulation parameters that I was showing, you typically should be safe. But if I had to pick between the two, I would, I would use the cone beam, but I know certainly, um, you know, if you don't have one, you know, it's still possible to do this type of implant. Okay. Um, so we have the next question by Dr. Siu Hang. How, how do you remove a failed pterygoid implant? Uh, typically, if you have a failed pterygoid implant, uh, it's very easy to remove. It, uh, the pterygoid implant failures I've dealt with, uh, most of the time you can just grab hold of the multi-union abutment and just pull it out or sometimes just uh, very minimal uh, reverse torque. And then um, many times uh, with a failed pterygoid implant, uh, we'll just allow that area to heal for uh, about eight to 12 weeks and go back in and we can place another one. And uh, just because you have one failure doesn't mean that you can't go back to that site. Uh, one thing about a pterygoid implant is uh, in many cases, you only get one attempt at placing the implant. And if you don't engage the uh, dense bone of the pterygomaxillary complex, um, many times after that first attempt, you're not able to get it. Now, because I've done so many of these, I am sometimes able to uh, redirect a drill and still engage that harder bone, but it is much more difficult if you don't get it on the first try. Um, so if it does fail, then you still can go back later uh, and do another one, but it is very simple to uh, remove the implants. If they fail, they usually just pull right out. Okay, definitely so. Uh, next question we have from Dr. Umesh. What what are minimum and maximum length of implant needed to engage the pterygoid bone? Uh, well, typically in the literature, um, it's uh, reported a minimum of 13 millimeters. Um, and you 
can go all the way up to 25 millimeters. Um, there are a few companies uh, such as Norris Medical that make specific implants designed for pterygoid placement. Uh, many implant companies, you could still utilize their regular implant as long as it's long enough to engage the pterygomacular complex. Uh, but I can tell you that typically I'm using, I, my average size is 18 millimeters in length. Uh, but, you know, I have many cases where we'll put in a 16 millimeter implant, um, some even a 13 millimeter implant. Uh, and then some cases we're replacing a 22 and very rarely a 25. Um, basically when we're using the osteotome or the drill, uh, you know, we could feel the density of the bone. And that's where, with this being a field type procedure, you know, I'm looking for the maximum torque I can get. And you know, that's going to be a little bit different for each case. So I'd say on average between 13 to 18 millimeters for most of the cases, you'll engage that bone. And like I said, in most of my cases, I'm using a 18 millimeter implant. Now there are some reports in the literature of people using even longer implants. Uh, there is one report in literature where somebody used a zygomatic length implant uh, in the pterygoid area, and they actually got the tip of that implant into the cranial fossa close to the, you know, up close to the brain. And, you know, so I, I definitely would that. not, yeah, that's, uh, that's a bit risky. So I would, you know, even when I'm placing mm -hmm. a 25 millimeter implant, I, I start getting a little nervous because it's, I know I'm getting closer to the maxillary artery. And uh, so I try not to go quite that long if I can avoid it. Definitely so. Uh, next we have from Dr. Chetan. Does patients experience any opening limitations if the implant develops issues in long term as the coronoid process is in the close proximity laterally? Um, well, I think sometimes the, the you know, a regular radiograph is a, a bit misleading uh, because if you look at this on a, uh, you know, cone beam scan or a CT scan, you know, we're angling this implant medially, you know, so while it looks like on a regular panoramic radiograph that it's close to the coronoid process, you know, the, this implant is angling medially, so it's actually quite far away from that. Uh, there are a handful of reports of some trismus in the literature, um, but uh, those typically are transient and go away. Uh, I can tell you my personal experience with these, I've had a couple of patients that have had a little bit of trismus, uh, but in terms of limited mouth opening, no, we don't really see that very much at all with this type of procedure. Okay. Um, then we have from Dr. Sham. If pterygoid plate is not engaged, like implant is shorter or not immediate loading, will it work after osteointegration? Uh, it can. Um, now, the... Uh, you know, the majority of implants in the uh, older studies and even a lot of the studies that are still coming out were not immediately loaded. And if you look at a lot of meta-analysis of um, pterygoid implant studies, there's quite a few articles that end up getting thrown out because uh, what were being called pterygoid implants, many of the implants were not actually engaging the uh, denser bone of the pterygomaxillary complex. A lot of them were just tuberosity uh, type implants. And, uh, you know, they still were working. Many of those cases could not be immediately loaded. Um, so it would be very similar to say placing an implant in, uh, you know, a second molar area, you know, just back in the tuberosity area, not really any difference. Um, but in order to know that you really have truly engage that dense bone of the pyramidal process or the uh, pterygoid process or the pterygomaxillary pillar, you're going to feel a significant change in the amount of torque that you have. And if your torque is low, then more than likely, almost guaranteed you're too far lateral and you need to angle your drill a little bit more medially to engage that bone. 
Yes, sir. Uh, next, we have from Dr. Alok. Do you use any specific implant like pterygoid implant or like conventional implant as used for other areas? Um, yes. So in the past, I used just conventional implants, um, you know, longer implants, uh, you know, 15 millimeter, 16 millimeter, um, you know, sometimes 13 millimeter. Um, because for many of the manufacturers, that was the longest implant that was available from them. Um, now, um, for, for quite a while now, I've been utilizing uh, Norris Medical, and they make uh, you know, specific implants for the pterygoid. Uh, they're called TerraFit, and they have a little bit different design. Um, and there's some other companies that do have some other um, specifically designed pterygoid implants in other part of the world. Uh, but where I'm at, uh, uh, I believe it's just Norris that has these specific pterygoid design implants. And the design's a little bit different. Uh, they typically will have a little bit more narrow and aggressive end cutting tip because uh, as you're engaging that dense bone in the uh, pterygomaxillary complex, you need, uh, you want a nice aggressive end cutting tip that can engage that bone and uh, continue to move forward as you tighten it because that bone is very, very hard. If you're utilizing, a, say, a non-cut end cutting implant, many times you'll go from the soft bone of the tuberosity, you'll hit the denser bone, and then the implant will just spin because it's not able to engage that denser bone because it's not an end cutting implant. Um, so if you were going to use a uh, standard type of implant that wasn't a specific pterygoid design implant, then I would just want to make sure that it's an end cutting implant and that it has a uh, narrower uh, apex compared to the platform, uh, you know, typically like a, a tapered type implant. And, you know, diameter wise, um, anywhere between 3.5 to 4.3 uh, millimeters in diameter if you're looking to use um, a standard type of implant. Okay. Uh, next we have Dr. Shaheen. If it fails in first place, how much should we wait for the second time? Uh, typically we'll wait about a minimum of eight weeks, uh, eight to 12 weeks, and then we'll go back in there and um, see about putting another one in. Okay. Next we have Dr. Aminuli. What about isolating artery before drilling? Um, there aren't any reports in the literature about anyone doing that. And the, uh, you know, your access back there, you'd, uh, you'd have to do quite a bit more reflection. And I don't think that that would be necessary. Um, you know, I guess you could certainly do that if you wanted to, but I, I've, I've never heard of anybody doing that. Um, and as long as you, you had a thorough knowledge of the anatomy back there. I don't really think it would be necessary to do that. To date in the literature, there aren't any reports of anyone hitting a maxillary artery or the pterygoid venous plexus. Uh, certainly it could have happened and you know everything's not documented in the literature. But um, you know, right now in the dental lit, there aren't any reports of that happening uh, in terms of complications. Um, occasionally you'll get a little bit of bleeding from that area. Uh, and most of the articles report that just by simply placing the implant and it was plugging the osteotomy that that takes care of the bleeding. Um, there are a handful of reports of the implants being displaced into uh, like the infratemporal fossa uh, or the pterygoid fossa, basically because the implant wasn't actually engaged into the type one bone, it was just the soft bone. And, you know, you keep tightening it and then it just disappears. And in uh, watching a few clinicians do these, uh, I've seen a case or two where uh, I had to step in and tell the person to stop because I could see the implant was extremely mobile and 
if they tightened it too much for, uh, further, it was going to disappear. And then that's going to be very difficult to go find. And so uh, it, in terms of um, you know, complications and the isolating arteries, um, I don't think that would be necessary. And I haven't heard of anybody doing that, but you know, it's certainly possible. Okay. So next we have uh, from Dr. Nick. One of the challenges I have had in placing pterygoids is that prosthetically it ends up asymmetrical if you can get both sides stable. In some cases where I can only get one side stable but not the other side, I end up removing the stable one so we can maintain prosthetic symmetry. What is your experience in restoring asymmetrical restorations with one uh, with only one pterygoid and patient acceptance? Yeah, so I think the last, the last, uh, the end of that state statement was part of the key was patient acceptance. So if I need that pterygoid implant, if it's a uh, like a rescue case, I showed one and I absolutely need that implant, then it has to stay no matter what. If it's uh, in, you know, an extra implant that's you know really there to eliminate cantilever um, and wouldn't necessarily compromise the prosthesis if we didn't utilize it, then, uh, you know, I will ask the patient and I find in about 75% of the cases that are okay with just leaving it. Uh, in about 25% of the cases, uh, the patient will ask if it, uh, the restoration could not be extended back there. And that in those cases, then we basically will just um, remove the multi-unit abutment, uh, put a, uh, cover screw and just bear the implant and we have it back there uh, for a rainy day in case there's any emergency in the future we can always go back and it's you know essentially like a spare tire in your car you always have it back there to use yeah. but it won't be included in the restoration so you know we're looking at whether it's needed or not prosthetically and then if it's not absolutely necessary then we'll let the patient decide if they want it there or not okay so uh, next we have from uh, Dr. Hawker, what should we do during excessive bleeding happens? Uh, well, like I said, in, uh, I've done quite a few of these and uh, you know, over the years, I knock on wood have not had any excessive bleeding scenarios. Typically um, you'll get a little bit of oozing, you know, occasionally I've had a little bit more uh, copious blood flow. Uh, in those situations, I'd say probably 99% of the time, just when you insert the implant, that will uh, stop the bleeding and uh, promote the hemostasis. And if you look in the literature, there's a number of articles that report very similar. Um, if you, uh, you know, if you were to hit the, uh, you know, one of the, you know, the uh, pterygoid venous plexus. Um, you know, I did have a colleague who told me one time he wasn't sure, but he thought he might have hit it and that he had a pretty profuse amount of bleeding for close to an hour. And in that situation, he just uh, kept applying significant amounts of pressure and uh, said that, you know, with just time, he was able to get the bleeding to stop. Um, I know some people have um, taken um, epinephrine soaked gauze and placed it into the area that has slowed the bleeding. Um, uh, but again, I, most of the time in the literature and from what I've seen personally, just placing the implant in nearly all cases stops the hemorrhaging. And you know, if you do hit the artery or if you do hit the pterygoid plexus, you, you're gonna have some very profuse bleeding. It's not going to be a, you know, an ooze or a, a just a, a, you know, a, a slight amount. Of, it's going to be, you know, a very dramatic amount of, of blood flow. And again, fortunately, you know, we've never seen this, and you know, there's not any reports in the literature of this. Um, and again, in order to have that happen, you'd really have to be off with your angle, or you'd have to be using um, an excessive length drill or an excessive length implant uh, but 
that's typically how if we do encounter bleeding that we get it to stop. So um, is this quite similar to the management of hematoma? Uh, yes. Uh, you know, after, uh, afterwards, we don't see a whole lot of, you know, with this particular implant, you know, occasionally we'll get a little bit of trismus. We don't uh, we don't really see very much hematoma uh, with this, um, you know, uh, but typically, you know, when we're doing this procedure or any full arch procedure, you know, we're having the patient utilize, um, you know, ice after the procedure, uh, steroids, uh, anti-inflammatories. And again, uh, we don't tend to get a whole lot of uh, trismus or hematoma or any type of issues like that uh, with these. Um, it's, it's, I'd say, pretty uncommon. Okay. Uh, next we have from Dr. Sham. Uh, for, for prosthesis to take impression, what angle transmucosal abutment is recommended? Uh, yes. So uh, typically for me, I'm using, I'd say on average, a 30 degree multi-unit abutment, uh, occasionally a 17 degree multi-unit abutment, uh, but 30, I'd say would be the more common. And in terms of height, um, in, in the literature, there's a number of mentions uh, that, you know, the tuberosity tissue back here is thicker. And, you know, when I'm reflecting the tissue back here, typically I'll do a distal wedge or I'll thin the palatal tissue back in this area or the tuberosity tissue uh, to uh, reduce the thickness of that tissue to make it uh, more conducive to uh, abutment placement. Because uh, if you don't thin that tissue out, if you don't reduce that amount of thick tissue, then many times it can be difficult to access the abutment. Um, but if you trim the tissue during placement, typically, I'll place a 30 degree abutment that's uh, three millimeters in height, occasionally a four millimeter in height, 30 degree multi-unit abutment. Uh, but again, trimming that tissue makes it life a lot easier for the restorative dentist. And this is one thing that I hear a lot of people talk about with pterygoid implants is, you know, oh, they're very difficult to restore. Um, I haven't really found that to be the case, uh, quite honestly, but, you know, um, but I am trimming tissue uh, and, you know, I am trying to make the uh, abutment come out in a, uh, a good angulation that's easy to get to. And, you know, if you put your multi-unit abutment on and it's not coming out quite to the uh, point that you want it, then you can slightly turn the implant uh, to change the angulation if, you know, your abutment... Um, angulations are not quite where you want them to be. But trimming that tissue is going to help quite a bit. Okay. Uh, next we have from Dr. Alok. Is there any chance that we can break pterygoid plate? Uh, yes, uh, you definitely can. And sometimes that can happen if you under prepare the site too much. Um, so sometimes people will be tempted to try to under prepare like we do in other parts of the oral cavity and especially in the anterior maxilla, you know, cause the bone's a bit softer, you know, that, you know, works fairly well, but when you under prepare too much with these, when you're engaging that bone, you know, the torque on these can sometimes get very, very, very high if you're, you know, really engaged pterygoid maxillary complex. Um, and if you've underprepared it too much, um, if you're utilizing uh, an implant that has, say, a wider apex, then you're just going to hit that dense bone. It won't engage the osteotomy, and the implant's just going to spin. If you do engage that osteotomy and you have it too underprepared, as you tighten, then that torque value is going to start getting really, really high. And then certainly you're at risk of fracturing that. And if you fracture it, then, you know, you go from really high torque to zero torque instantly. 
and you have to abort and you're gonna have to you know wait eight 12 weeks let that heal and then come back and try it again so typically once we uh, once i engage that pterygomaxillary maxillary complex i will still then utilize drills uh, to get the osteotomy to you know a standard size to where we can put the implant in and then at that point you know a lot of it is feel if the torque's getting you know really 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 high then i'm going to increase the osteotomy diameter a little bit uh, because exactly like you said, we don't want to risk fracturing that, that complex. Definitely, sir. Uh, next, we have from Dr. Nishan. What are the indications of two pterygoid implants placement unilaterally? Um, unilaterally placing two? I can tell you that I've never done that. And I've seen a few cases where that has been done. I think that uh, just from an anatomic standpoint, that would be really difficult to do because we know from the anatomic measurements of the pterygomaxillary complex to fit two implants into that limited island of bone would, would be very, very tough. And uh, I've never done that. And I could tell you, I really wouldn't ever have any plans to do it. Uh, so it, in my personal recommendation, I would not attempt it. I think one, there's not quite enough bone to do it. And two, then it's putting you at a lot higher risk for hitting some of those vital structures in that area. Um, so that's just my personal opinion. I know there are some uh, reports in the literature where people have utilized two, uh, but me personally, uh, that's something that I wouldn't do. Definitely. Uh, next is from Dr. Nehel. Does 30 degree multi unit correct 70 degree angle correction? Do you use close or open tray impression copings? Um, you know, it in terms of um, in terms of abutment selection, again, um, typically 30 degree. Yes, if you have, um, you know, occasionally I've used a 45 degree abutment, um, not very often. Uh, 30 degree works in most cases. Um, I can tell you, I have seen uh, a handful of colleagues that have utilized straight abutments. And uh, the issue that I've seen with the zero degree abutment is uh, because the angle is so much, uh, sometimes the milling machines will not uh, allow that angle and it just will not mill. Uh, for that. And, uh, you know, so those uh, definitely do not recommend, uh, although there are some reports in the literature where people are utilizing those. Um, I know on my milling machines in the office, if there's ever a, a zero degree abutment place, it just, it just refuses to mill the uh, prosthesis. It just won't allow it. Um, so typically, like I said, 17 degree on occasion, 30 degree for most cases, occasionally a 45 degree. And then the, um, I'm sorry, what was the second part of the question? Uh, that is, do you use closer open tray impression ah, copings? Uh, yes. So do believe it or copings? not, um, I'll just use, uh, we'll use closed tray impression copings. And for the majority of our cases, we'll use closed tray impression copings. In the past, we would utilize open tray, uh, splint them together, um, and what I can tell you is that over the years, we have switched to utilizing closed tray impression copings, and we just have not had any issues with them. Our, our fits are still accurate. Um, so we utilize closed tray impression copings uh, for almost all the cases. So uh, next question is there again from Dr. Hawker. How much millimeter should uh, insert to pterygoid bone? Um, well, I, you know, in the literature, you know, we can get up to eight millimeters of engagement into that bone. Um, really, again, this is a, it's, it's an entirely feel process. And so, you know, if uh, your torque is high, uh, then you really don't know how much you've engaged until you're finished because it's a complete blind process. You can't really stop 
I mean, I guess you could stop in the middle of your implant insertion, take the patient over and have them get a scan done and then bring them back to the chair. But, you know, I, I don't, I've never heard of that being done. And so you're inserting the implant, you're measuring to depth. And, you know, when you're inserting it, um, you can, you know, have that feel of how much torque insertion you have. And that's really what I'm gauging this by when we're doing the implant in this area is just the feel of the insertion torque. And then afterwards, you're taking a radiograph and seeing what you have. Um, but you're really not going to know until you're finished. And so everything is going to be, you know, all by feel with this procedure. And that's one of the reasons that this procedure is, um, uh, is scary for some doctors is because one is blind. You can't see what you're doing and you can't take any radiographs to guide you during the uh, insertion process. You know, it's really a very much feel type of procedure. Definitely so. So it's a blind procedure moreover. Yes. So, uh, next question we have from Dr. Rudy. Uh, what is your impression material of choice? Uh, typically we're using a light body and a heavy body uh, polyvinyl siloxane impression. Okay. So I think uh, we're not having much questions after this. This has been uh, quite an awesome lecture actually. We've got a lot of questionnaires. So, you know, it has created an interest in uh, the participants itself. So good. I'm glad. It was Yes, it was a beautiful session for everyone. So with this, I think uh, we are going to uh, to the end of the session. Okay. Uh, I would like, yes, sir, continue. I was going to say, well, thank you for the opportunity to uh, share this lecture. And thank you to everyone from around the world for spending an hour of your day with us or an hour of your night with us. Definitely so. So with this, we'll move on to the end of the session. And uh, I would like to uh, inform all the participants to go to www.gomha.org for further participation and see certificates information. So thank you so much, sir, for the beautiful session. And all the participants, stay tuned for other interesting lectures, too. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.